Happy New Year! This is Stephanie again from Apex Languages with Ornery Orthography. Three long months ago, I made a promise to teach you guys all there is to know about commas. But between election season and holidays, I might have gotten a little sidetracked, distracted. Well, the year's not over yet, for me at least, technically. So are you guys ready to ring in 2021 with more fun with commas? Oh boy, I can't wait. Hope you've been practicing. So again, I have two lists of comma rules for you all. This short, basic, easy to remember one is all I think you really need for day-to-day -day survival. Commas are used to organize lists, separate extra information, avoid confusion, and recommend short pauses. The longer one confers basically the same stuff, but breaks it down into more details to help you impress your boss. Last time we talked about how to divide up list. Remember, you only need two adjectives, but three nouns to qualify for commas. And we reviewed some common comma formulas, those involved in addresses, dates, and people's titles. Finally, I introduced you to the seven coordinating conjunctions, and, but, so, or, nor, and for. These, technically, should all be preceded by a comma when dividing complete sentences, but in reality, you have a lot more flexibility, especially when it comes to and. One more important note on that. Coordinating conjunctions should have commas, but subordinating conjunctions, like because and if, do not actually need any punctuation, as long as they stay where they're supposed to be, at the end of the sentence. If the clause is moved to the beginning of the sentence, however, as you can see here, you should add a comma. That's because of rule number six. For more details on that and the other remaining rules, stay tuned. That means don't go away. First, let's start with rule number five, which states that you use commas to distinguish, tell the difference between non-essential extras from the main clause. This is where we really start getting to the heart of what commas are all about. A period's job is to tell you when everything that needs to be said about a single idea has been said. Commas, on the other hand, are about clarifying for the reader what part of that information is the most important, what is essential, needed, required, as opposed to non-essential, optional, extra. Let's look at these two lists, for example. What is the difference? Make sure to get the golden delicious apples. Make sure to get the golden delicious apples. Because of the comma, the adjective golden in this first sentence is considered an optional additional detail. The apples are delicious. They are also golden, like these apples in the picture potentially. But in the second sentence, golden is not optional. Golden delicious apples, the ones in the second picture, are a specific type of apple. So if you don't include both adjectives, you could potentially end up with the wrong fruit, Red Delicious or even Granny Smith. Now, let's try this out with longer clauses instead of individual words. What is the difference between these two sentences? Apples, which come in many different colors, are good for baking. Apples that are green are the best for baking. Again, the first one with the commas and which is non-essential. The information is non-essential. My main sentence states that apples are good for baking. By the way, did you know that they come in lots of different varieties? It may be useful information, but it's not my main point. In other words, the most important thing that I wanted to tell you. In the second sentence with that, however, I want you to know that while yes, apples come in all shades of the rainbow, the green ones specifically are the best. Get rid of that subordinate clause and the sentence changes significantly. Apples 
not pears or cherries or blueberries, are the best for baking. That is why this comma-less information is considered essential. On to rule number six, and oh look, it's our good old friend basic English word order. Subject, verb, and optionally, objects, adverbs, and prepositional phrases. For example, we are celebrating New Year's tonight at home. In this sentence, we is the subject, are celebrating is a present progressive verb with New Year's as its direct object, tonight is an adverb of time, and at home is a prepositional phrase of location. Now, what happens if I really want to emphasize that this is happening tonight? Well, in English at least, the closer something is to the beginning of the sentence, the more important it is. So, I'll just move my adverb over here, and voila, my new sentence reads, tonight we are celebrating New Year's at home. The comma acts like flashing light, saying warning, warning. This adverb is not supposed to be here. Your main clause has not started yet. This is not the subject. Many people do not use this comma, especially with short time phrases like tonight. So once again, this punctuation can be considered optional. The longer your phrase, however, the less optional it becomes. Let's see some more, uh, some more examples. Okay, we'll move the prepositional phrase up and we've got at home, we are celebrating New Year's tonight or make it really long. As long as we can find enough chairs for everyone who's coming, we are celebrating New Year's here. With that last one, you can appreciate how helpful that comma can really be. Last but not least, we use commas to indicate a pause, the lack of which could lead to confusion. Commas live to flag non-essential information, but from a practical standpoint, you could also argue that their main purpose is reminding you when to breathe. Periods call for long pauses. Commas mark shorter ones. And really, if I could give you just one single rule for when to use a comma, it would be whenever you hear a brief pause, whenever you have to stop to breathe. There will be times when this is your only clue, sentences that do not follow any of the other rules we've seen thus far, but which could mean something completely different depending on how you punctuate. My favorite example of this is always, let's eat grandma, which either results in a yummy meal or murder charges. I'll say both again. Listen for the pause. Let's eat grandma, let's eat grandma. There's no pause in the second one, which means grandma is the direct object. Grandma is dinner. Here's another confusing example related to the Oxford comma issue. As I explained in the previous video, the final comma before and in a list is very commonly omitted, even in formal documents and newspapers, etc. But there are plenty of times when that extra comma could prevent confusion. In the first sentence of our new group here, it is clear that Richard and Julie are part of a longer list of people being introduced at a party. Okay, my parents, Richard, and Julie. In the second one, however, one may alternatively assume that you're actually just introducing the two of your parents whose name happen to be Richard and Julie. Because there's the potential of at least two different interpretations, we call that ambiguity, the writer saves himself half a second of typing at the cost of confusing their readers. Finally, here, creative punctuation gives us two completely different sentences. In the first, a woman without her man is nothing. We understand that women need men. In the second, a woman without her man is nothing. Well, now it's men who need women. 
I'll say both of those one more time so you can hear the pauses. A woman without her man is nothing. A woman without her man is nothing. It's a subtle change that makes a huge difference. All right, that's enough for now. Go back to your merrymaking. I'll even give you the night off from homework this time. Still, if you find any interesting examples of what I've talked about here, feel free to share them below in the comments or email me. Thanks for a great first year. I produced more than 70 videos in 2020, so go check them out at apexlanguages.com. And don't worry, more will be coming. Wishing you and yours a prosperous new year. Stay happy, stay healthy, and stay safe. See you later.